Hi everyone, number one Marmaduke fan here. Previously, I have reviewed and recommended Jim Kay's illustrated edition of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. My thought is if you are a fan of the Harry Potter, this of the Harry Potter series, you're gonna love the, these illustrated books. These are a great gifts for Harry Potter fans. And in that first video, I kind of talked about several topics. I talked about why I would advocate for children's book illustrations. I add I talked about how there were some points where I didn't like Jim Key's interpretation of the character of Dobby and things like that. But what I argued was that that can actually help someone break out a bit from what they're comfortable doing while reading. Think about how they imagine the characters and why they imagine them that way and maybe kind of remix their imagination. So if you read these books and the only thing you're thinking of is the movies, uh, Jim Kay might bust you out a bit and get you to rethink about these books in a new way. Uh, for this one, so but but the thing was I talked about a lot of topics. I didn't really have a thesis except I like Jim K. I've highlighted a couple. I've put a bookmark in one illustration in particular. I want to talk about as a strong illustration. But my question for this one is: What's the difference between book illustration that looks like book illustration and Renaissance paintings that look like paintings? Were the Renaissance painters just illustrators who just illustrated different subject matters? Did they just illustrate? biblical scenes and Greek myth and the battles of their wealthy patrons? Or was there something in their style which is so visually distinct from contemporary illustration that we, we can see it? And uh, one thing I would think of is that Jim Kay is using a variety of media rather than just a few media. He is using different kinds of traditional media to get different sorts of emotions and textures and types of scenes. Warm scenes, cool scenes, exciting scenes, calm, calm scenes, uh, little details, big, big picture landscapes. And by using so many different types of media, he's giving us variety and he's fitting his media to tone. And I even love this. I clearly remember reading about Azkaban uh, as a child and thinking of it as just this great, ugly, gray stone slab. And this is a bit more white stone, but there's this emphasis on Azkaban and the boats around Azkaban in the first few pages. And what's interesting is, except for a few dream sequences, I don't think the Harry Potter team ever really sees Azkaban firsthand. They just hear about it as this scary thing in, in their imaginations, as this impregnable prison. So I like seeing these establishing shots. It's not the exact way I imagined Azkaban, but it is the emotion of a place like Azkaban, an impregnable prison, a grim and dreary place you'd never want to find yourself trapped. And golly gee willikers. Let's just flip through to see if I get, uh, get some sparks. And if I get stuck, I'll just flip ahead to the illustration I know I want to talk about. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, what, oh, that's right. And I was starting by talking about Renaissance, Renaissance painters versus children's book illustration, even like really talented children's book illustration like this, where he's aging Harry gradually, uh, change by degrees rather than change by leaps and bounds. If Harry looked like an 11 year old in the second book and he looked like a 16 year old in the third book, it'd be weird. All he's all Kay has done is slightly elongated Harry's face to show that he's starting to go through puberty. He's starting to get, you know, bigger and taller. But even though he's having a growth spurt, it's not a completely different character. It's that same character from the last book, very slightly older. Go, you had art and designing characters and designing worlds is often about making subtle adjustments that are barely perceptible, but the eye is really good at catching those little, we're really good at spot the differences. That's why people like spot the differences books. People will notice the work you put into it, even if it's subtle, because the subtlety is what is making it realistic. It's not jarring them out of the world. So I didn't like that. I didn't like that book so much. Kind of, he Kay gave it a way of walking around, but that's the point. It's different than what I might be comfortable or used to imagining. Uh, and uh, and by doing that, it, it breaks me out. So I'm what what I love about this is I love this illustration and it's powerful and there's variety to it. But I'm not quite able to nail down 
what it is. So I could look at a manga style and I could say, well, this is an 80s manga style. This is a 90s manga style. This is a 2000s manga style or an 80s Marvel comic book style. But I can't quite pin down what uh, Jim K is doing because Jim K is always doing something different. Page by page, that's it. Great artists are always improving themselves. They're always changing. They're always getting better. And Jim K is always changing his approach to these books to get the proper emotional response. And sometimes it'll even change how they draw, he draws the character from scene to scene, or you'll flip a page and it'll be a whole new media. Here we go. I think this is washes of ink, probably using a Chinese brush. And unlike flat colors of ink, so if you had like six shades of ink, black, dark gray, medium gray, light gray, you would get a very consistent look everywhere. But if you use just black ink and uh, and water, so chi Chinese brush techniques, you kind of mix the ink yourself. It gets more and more watery as you run out of ink and it goes from a rich black to a medium gray to a very light gray. And I think in this uh, building, I don't know if this is, that's gotta be St. Paul's Cathedral is what that is. We can see if I can get it to focus how this is working. So my guess is when Kay was drawing this, he drew that horizontal line to establish the bottom row and then started drawing the columns. Dark, 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 getting a little lighter. And then this one is just about as light as this. So he drew the horizontal stripe and then up, up, up. And then here's where he started to run out of ink. And because of that, it creates a three-dimensional effect where in the front it's darker and then towards the back it's lighter. And he did that without having to shade every little detail of St. Paul's Cathedral here. The medium and how he used his traditional media created that effect for him. Be because as I've said in past videos, ink and these traditional uh, materials, they misbehave. They may do things you didn't want them to do, but they misbehave in a way that immerses the viewer and imitates the thing, the way things work, work in the real world. In the real world, when you look at something, it's never all one shade or one color. It's, it's, shades, it's shades from light to dark wrapping around the building. And you can either convey that very fastidiously, you know, spending 90 hours on just the building, or you can convey that in a quick sketch so that it becomes, when you zoom out and it resolves, it just blends in naturally with the whole composition. Excellent. And then, so that was just a kind of a quick sketch of St. Paul's, but Kay also has that ability to hone in and draw something really detailed and really realistic. So these are cartoony illustrations of things on the bathroom tiles at the Leaky Cauldron, but Kay hasn't just drawn the illustrations. He's drawn the bathroom tiles with enough detail that they read as, you know, the grainy, grungy textures of bathroom tiles. When there are pages without illustrations, he will provide... Uh, some textures like parchment texture or map textures. He loves these scenes with lots of creatures and animals. And later, if I can find it, there's a direct homage to Bosch, a medieval religious painter who is he, he would Bosch has done did a lot of paintings, but his most famous painting are his crazy scenes of paradise and hell, where he's drawing all kinds of crazy bird monsters and egg creatures. And it's like the tortures of hell are all these insane demons. And it was, it, what's amazing about Bosch is he was a surrealist hundreds of years before surrealism was a movement or a, or a thing. He, okay, Kay's Dementors. So I always used to just pretty much imagine the, the Dementors as ring rays from J.R.R. Tolkien and the movie. I like the third movie. The, the, let me just talk about this book generally. So the third book in Harry Potter, it's the one I didn't understand when I was a little kid. I understood one and two okay. But for a while, I didn't like The Prisoner of Azkaban because I didn't get why here, I didn't get why Sirius was innocent when I read it the first time. I think I was just reading too fast and I missed some things. And then I returned to it as an adult. And this has actually become one of my favorites in the entire series. My, my take on this series is that it started as kind of like, you know, little kids books and then it got better and better and sort of peaked around three, four, five. And then the, the conclusion didn't, they're okay. It's an okay conclusion, but it's pretty much wrapping up the, the Voldemort fight. But the, mo the main appeal of these books is the wonder of the world and Harry solving mysteries and getting into trouble at school. And the, the war with Voldemort sort of took center stage for the climax in books six and seven. So three, four, and five are really where I think this series hit its stride. It's where it started to become a phenomenon. 
Here's that strange paper texture I couldn't quite identify. I don't think it's paper towel. I think it's some sort of fine paper parchment. So I doubt that Kay drew that. I bet this is one of his materials that he draws on top of. But Kay's such a good illustrator. Who knows? Maybe, maybe he actually did draw this, and this is just another Saturday for him. Wow, look at these hippogriffs. Rowling's hippogriffs are different than hippogriffs I've seen in other media, but they're a fascinating creature, and Kay loves taxonomy. He loves birds and horses and eagles. He, his, his ability to draw anything is absolutely necessary for a project like this. You couldn't undertake a project like this if all you could do was a few little portraits. His Snape is a little bit like Alan Rickman. The actor Alan Rickman changed how a lot of people saw Snape. Uh, before Alan Rickman played the part, I kind of just saw Snape as an evil, you know, goateed supervillain, you know, who would t literally twirl his mustache and stuff. And the illustrations before the movies came out are very different than the perception of Snape after the movies have come out. This evokes the idea of Alan Rickman, but it's not just Alan Rickman's face slapped on here. You could look at that and say, yep, that's Snape. This fits with the description Rowling gives, but you don't have to accept Kay's imagination of Snape as your imagination. And this is just a good medie medieval-esque portrait. It reminds me of uh, Van Eyck. That Van Eyck is what I, I'm reminded of. So, the, yeah, so this is, let's return back to my thesis. So what's the difference between a children's book illustrator and a Renaissance master? And in many ways, their jobs were similar. The, the wealthy patron would want some paintings done, and the Renaissance artist and maybe their studio of assistants would accomplish that. They'd tell the story of the biblical scene or the battle using their painting. But uh, I think maybe the main difference I see between Renaissance painting and children's book illustration is that this illustration is meant to be to fit within the world of the book. So even here, everything about this page is designed for the chapter title at the top. And it's designed with the idea in mind that you're going to flip through these pages where there's no pictures, but they still give you a little texture, so it still feels really cool. And they build things. So you'll, know you'll have like some calm pages, and then you'll have a big explosive visual page like this, and then back to some calm pages, calm, 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 and then boom. Uh, also, Kay is using, he's using some things, Renaissance-esque things like portraits or collections of people, but he's adding different things into the mix. So this is a scientific illustration of a creature from Harry Potter. And da Vinci used to make studies like this, not quite like this. I don't think da Vinci ever did like these watercolor paintings in his studies. Most of his studies were just one color of chalk on old paper. But I know that Kay is someone who knows his art history and pays attention to art history and then pulls bits and pieces from art history as he needs to so he can create a world that has variety fitting with the the world of harry potter the world of harry potter is this imaginative world with lots of cool and crazy things in it and k here, here here we go again so this is unlike those illustrations we just saw of the little monster what is that a grindy grindy low now we're doing art nouveau style illustration with a very simplified tree and very idealized curving branches and very simple colors, solid blue, solid yellow, solid black. That's actually gold, okay. K, because K is using so many traditional materials, I don't know if K is actually using gold foil, which is possible, and then embossing into that gold foil some engraved drawings. He, he also could just be painting to imitate that, but I, I was really impressed. Every little detail conveys something I've seen in art history and in hundreds of styles all coming together into one. Another tack, a kind of scientific illustration of werewolves. Uh, the Grimm. Ha the Grimm in the book only sh appears in a few scenes. Almost kind of, you almost wonder if Harry's just seen things. When uh, Kay illustrates it, every version of the Grimm is a little different, but they all convey the idea of this phantom, uh, fearsome thing, which exists there as a strong sh shape. So early we, we saw the, the very first time the Grimm appeared, it was just a white white charcoal probably on black background. So it's ominous black, and it's like it's emerging out of the darkness. This time it's a silhouette. So there's variety in how he treats the Grimm. It's not always just, ooh, a scary silhouette. Sometimes it's a scary silhouette. Sometimes it's a portrait emerging out of the darkness. And sometimes, uh, as we'll see later, it's this giant portrait filling the page. I love his Marauder's Map. You know, how would you show multiple floors of Hogwarts? And he's given us a three-quarters view 
And boy, I just want a whole map of Jim Kay's imagination of Hogwarts Castle that you could fold out and see everything in all the little rooms. My goodness. So that's architecture. It's not enough just to have good portraits or good understanding of landscape drawing. He understands architecture and math mathematics. Golly, gee willikers. Here's now back to a bit more of a normal straight on pose. That's one of the things I was thinking of. So a lot of Jim Kay's camera angles are kind of straight on camera angles in contrast with comic books, which might have, you know, like, oh, bird's eye, oh, worm's eye. There's, there's a lot of variety in those comic book illustrations. And Kay seems to favor a little bit more of a straight on window approach. We're looking through a window into the scene and we're not doing as much crazy stuff, you know, flying flying up and down. Not, that's not all, always true, but in a lot of the school scenes, I notice he just sort of takes on a, a straight on, you're sitting in the room looking straight at the action. Whereas in my imagination, since I kind of imagine it like a beautifully animated cartoon, I might imagine low angles, high angles, I'm always composing it in my head. So this is a imitation of a craft of a lion for a, a Quidditch game, and Kay has indicated the texture of thread. He doesn't have to indicate, well, yeah, this is a lot of detail, but it's just enough detail to convey the texture of thread, and then your mind accepts it as thread so that he can uh, have less detail here to make space for the title. So be smart with your details. Get the shapes down first, and then use enough details in the important areas to convey the whole texture, and then you can go looser and easier down here, and that's okay because our mind has already been able to accept this as thread. It's it's using your time smartly. You don't need you don't need my my microscopic detail on every little thread everywhere. You need the you need the details on the key parts of the image. That, that's my point. Now landscape painting with sort of gestural Rembrandt like marks. This is a kind of a this isn't this isn't dull, but the word for it is empty and calm and it's a calm scene of them walking to see Hagrid so it fits tonally and a little bit of energy is added with the silhouette of Hogwarts so we get a feel of the scale of the Hogwarts grounds so and and you need that you need calm scenes you need adventurous and exciting scenes I think flying around on the hippogriff is probably our example of it really being adventurous and exciting uh, Dumbledore actually has a nose that looks like it has been broken twice. The visual, dis the visual descriptions that Rowling gives are necessary for the illustrations to feel proper and like they fit, fit with this world. All right, here's the one I wanted to talk about. So a while ago on the train, we saw an image of the Dementors where they seem to have very physical presence, you know, the rotting hand. And here is an image of Dementors with black ink maybe watercolor, but it's very, a very watery medium that is almost ghostly, ephemeral, like it's a, it's a cloud, it's a mist. And this is a different take on the Dementors by the same artists in the same book. And this is good because this, you, you might imagine the Dementors in different ways and they might, they might scare you for different reasons. Like maybe the, the, the scabs and the rotting hands are what scared you. I was more scared by the idea of the cloaks and their billowing floatiness, like they're ghosts, like they're not really there. And by having variety in the way that he draws Dementors, he never picks one way of drawing them and sticks with it the whole book. There's that one, and a little later he draws another Dementor in that style. So people with different imaginations can both see, see certain ideas reflected in Kay's work, and the medium he is using is necessary to make this work because it's a watery, ephemeral medium to convey a see-through, ghostly monster. Have variety. Have, have as many tools in your kit as possible so that you can do something like this. If all you do is co color pencil, you can't do this because you've limited yourself to exactly one medium. Just a solid landscape illustration. This, this is taking me back to my watercolor classes with the one, yep, got hazier in the background, more solid in the foreground. Exactly. We need to talk about, uh, I need to brush up on aerial and atmospheric perspective, but Da Vinci has some great, right, da, da Vinci pretty much figured this stuff out because he was a scientist and he looked at his world so carefully. So he, he pretty much figured out 
all these effects of light that you can observe in reality. You can just go outside today and observe these things that da Vinci observed. And then da Vinci had the bright idea to just start including that, including that in his painting. He's a, there, there's a reason that these people who are, I shouldn't be calling him da Vinci actually, because that's just where he's from. He, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, our history teacher. I should be calling him Leonardo. And his, his full name is Leonardo da Vinci, but just calling him da Vinci is like saying, uh, hey, New York, how you doing, New York? You doing all right, New York? His name's Leonardo. So that, I think, is the shrieking shack. And look at how the trees convey the fear and the how derelict and abandoned it is. Yeah, boy. So what was I talking about? I was talking about variety in your media. I was talking about, I think I've hit on most of my topics. This was a scene that, that jarred me a bit because I remembered how I imagined this scene. I, I imagined Hermione putting her arms on top of Ron and kind of crying on, crying on his shoulder. Kay's made Ron tall, which is what this book describes. This book describes Ron as getting taller, but the actor didn't grow that tall. The, the actor didn't end up taller than the twins, but in the book, Ron was much taller and ganglier than, than the twins. So he's posed Hermione as shorter, you know, running up to Ron, and he's conveyed the idea of an awkward hug. I, always, I, I also imagined an awkward hug every time I imagined this book, but I just imagined it kind of a, a different type of awkward hug from a different angle. And seeing Kay draw a awkward hug differently than I imagined it shakes me up and strikes me thinking, you know, how, well, how do I draw an awkward hug? What are, what are ways to convey that idea? Looking at artists and looking at books gives you more reference points for how you can pose similar types of scenes later. Here we go. Look at this. So we've seen the Grimm twice. We saw the Grimm... Uh, as a just very light white sketch emerging out of darkness. We saw the Grimm as a silhouette, and now Kay fills up one, two, three, four pages with this great, I think, charcoal drawing of a Grimm with, wow, it's a big black dog. Charcoal is this rich black medium that gets you everything from the richest black possible to all all shades of light, light blacks and textures. Excellent. The medium fits the 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 illustration and the subject matter this seems i thought i saw the herbology center in the previous book and this just looks like a really wacky reimagination of it for this book so maybe that's k just playing with the ideas and changing it up from book to book okay here's his homage to i think it's hieronymus bosch and i most people just go by bosch because that's easier to remember but Go check out The Garden of Earthly Del Delights by Bosch if you haven't yet. That's one of the greatest paintings ever made. Completely insane and imaginative. We There's this tendency to think that we're super imaginative and clever, and people in the Middle Ages, they were all sort of stuffy and old-fashioned. Bosch was nuts. He would have been a top keck meme lord in our day and age with the kind of stuff he was painting. I love it. The uh, Kay had to censor it a little bit in the original that he's paying homage to. This monster's eating a naked man and there are birds flying out of his rear end. Total top kick, nutty, best meme, best meme award from the Middle Ages. Uh, yep, so I'm just going to, I don't want to show everything. Yeah, go get this book. I'm ru I've run out of topics to talk about. All the, the last few illustrations are fantastic, but I've touched on all the topics I really wanted to talk about. Variety, uh, use, building your, your skill set with as many medium as possible, be, improving your ability to draw all types of subject matter, not just one type of subject matter, so that you can tackle a project like this, and using your medium to convey different emotions. I love this. Uh, you know, even if you are not a Harry Potter fan, and I kind of understand. I, I can understand why you might just sort of look at this pad and say, "Oh, whatever. It's not for me." Jim K is an art boss, so at least you should go check out what Jim K is doing, even if you don't s slap down the money for these books. But check out Jim K because this is someone who gets the craft. I'm number one Marmaduke fan. Love you guys. Catch you later.